good morning. You're very welcome along to the weekend edition here on Highland Radio. Coming up on today's show, did you work at Unify and Letter Kenny? Well, there are plans to make a musical about the plant and the man behind it's looking for your memories. We'll chat to him. We hear of Annabelle's story of love, light and remembrance. The Michaela Foundation Girls Camp's coming to Donegal in the summer. It's open to 11 to 13 year olds and provides lots of fun, we're told. Well, we'll hear more about that a little later. You may remember we discussed the park run in Falcar earlier this year. Well, it's uh, taking place. We get an update on how it went. Craggy Island hosts the lovely girl competition. If you're a fan of Father Ted, we'll be going to Craggy Island to hear what's going on. And Transition Year students are hosting a series of concerts in Donegal to promote the Irish language. There's news on that. 86 777 Text us now or call us on 074-91-25000. Right. Uh, also coming up on the show, Patricia Swan is back uh, on the programme. She's a holistic health therapist. Uh, if you have any health questions, actually, and you want us to put them to Patricia, now is the time to get in contact. Uh, 086 777 or as I say, you can call us on 074 91 25000. We are in the mouth of a general election also, of course, and uh, we have... Uh, members of the Donegal Youth Council in studio to discuss uh, what it means to them. And uh, they're also organising, or have organised, a, a debate amongst the candidates. So it'll be interesting to hear what they think. Uh, OK, that's all coming up. First, a look at the papers. The Irish Daily Mail. Well, it's not me, because I'm here. Irish punter wins £66 million on Euro Millions. I don't think it was Yvonne either, because I don't think she'd be here. Uh, one Irish person became an astonishing €66 million Euro richer last night after the sharing after sharing the Euro Millions jackpot. What would you do with that money? Uh, the win means the lucky winner has overnight joined the top 200 richest people in the country after sharing the eye-watering €132 million Euro jackpot with another winner from France. Was it you? Get in contact. I want to borrow money. The Irish Independent and uh, this is a shocking story if you followed it. Doctor who mistook ankle for elbow was offered a full time job. A disgraced doctor who mistook an x-ray of an ankle for an elbow managed to work in a fourth hospital earning lucrative th fees through a locum agency. Uh, Dr. Omar Hassan, who's 30, and who was this week found guilty of professional misconduct at the Medical Council, was sent by an agency to provide medical cover in Our Lady's Hospital in Navan in January 2014. And this guy, in front of his peers, couldn't tell the difference between a ankle and an elbow. Uh, the Irish Times, abuse will shorten victims' lives, says family. The alleged sexual abuse suffered by a child in a foster home has shortened her life, this according to uh, her family, and there's much more in that story in that paper there. On to the Irish son, Eureka, we've done it again. One delighted Irish punter landed a monster 66 million euro sum on the Euro Millions last night. Labour won K tax cut for voters. Uh, Labour, of course, looking to return to power. Well, as part of that, they're promising... Um, a thousand euro into the pockets of low-paid workers in a desperate gamble to stay in power, says the paper. Public Expenditure Minister Brendan Howland last night revealed a broad range of giveaway tax policies, including USC cuts and PRSI reductions. Now, on to the Irish Daily Star. They lead with the 66 million euro jackpot. Irish euro million winners nets that amount of money, of course. And the same story uh, leads the Irish Daily Mirror. OK, you can look forward to Unify the Musical uh, later this year. The person behind it, Guy Lejeune, joins me in studio now. Guy, how are you? Hello there, how are you doing? Quite very, very good morning. indeed. <laughs> Beg your pardon? Quite cold this morning. Yes, it's freezing. Um, you're coming off the back of the huge success of Fiesta, aren't you? That You're the man behind that as well. That's correct, yeah. Um, this is this is kind of like a, a follow-on from Fiesta. Um, again, the Eregal Festival and, and Green Theatre and Donegal County Council are all kind of behind this. Um... My specialism, I suppose, is is in the area of reminiscence and making theatre from memories. And uh, from from Fiesta, we we all sat around and thought, oh, what could we do next? What we can, what could we do next? And um, I, I walked my dog down the old uh, Unify plant for a start. So I'd always seen this this empty space as being there's there's, there's stories here, the stories that should be told. Mm -hmm. um, and personally, from my own perspective, I um, I grew up in a textile town um, in England, so seeing the industry die seeing the industry fail um, and the jobs being lost um, seem to be something something of a universal story I mean if you look at Bunkrana with Fruit of the Loom if you look at Derry with the shirt factories and Fruit of the Loom if you look at Straban 
Adria. It's a, it's a, it's a universal story of the Northwest. Um, and now, I mean, it was a huge employer, but uh, as you say, of course, now you've already answered to some extent that you're focusing on the menus, memories, should I say, mm. but it's not the most sexiest place I would imagine ever to have worked. No, but um, fr from from already chatting with people, that you are actually starting to hear stories um, that not necessarily about the the manufacturing process, but more about the social history mm. of the place of of the tribes, of, as they've been described. Each each particular department was a was a tribe, and the fact that the that you had a, a small town effectively within a in a town um, using more water than Letterkenny can, you know, the the, the town itself, and the fact that you had this slight kind of friction between the the older plant one and plant two where the the sort of slightly younger workforce so there's already sort of little stories that are coming out of there um and when when you when you, when we say musical it, it's a difficult thing to describe it, it it's a play with music it's a play with movement it's a play with mime we we're trying to borrow as many um different ways of of telling the story without um you know fiesta was quite quite a simple piece it was dialogue and there was dancing but this i feel as though there's more to this place that and more pressure i imagine because um you know you are basing it on memories because you have an interesting style don't you in that you get you gather the stories gather the memories and and it's not a documentary as such but it intertwines these into sort of a a more prolonged narrative uh, yeah. and, and uh, so what happens then the audience get these little, oh, right, okay, I remember, maybe, you know what I mean? They're not, yes. it's not, it's not verbatim, but there's enough there to say, I think I know what he's on about here. Would that yeah. be a fair enough assessment? Yeah, it is, it is quite pressured, and, and y what you end up doing is kind of leaving out things that you think, well, that's an absolutely fabulous story, but it doesn't <laughs> quite fit into the kind of the play, which is a real shame. Um, so, so there's this pressure, and, but there's also the, the kind of, the, the wonderful f feeling on, on the opening night or, or, or at any show when you see I usually sit at the back of the audience and mm -hmm. watch the audience, and you can see people nudging each other, going, "Yeah, I remember that. Do you remember that?" <laughs> and that's that's really wonderful. And you kind of get the reaction at the end of people coming up to you and going, "Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Mm -hmm. I remember that." And that's a really wonderful thing. Um, and these, you know, the, the memories are really precious. That sort of social history. It's it's something that should be sort of celebrated and recalled and, and, and passed on to other people, you know, passed on to the next generation, you know. And I think Unify, um, well, I don't think I, I pretty much know, it's still very much in people's hearts as, and memories, as you mentioned. They recently had their 10-year yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, event so, for the closure, yeah, didn't they? Two years ago, and, yes. um, a huge turnout for that yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but interestingly, again, um, I, I was chatting to the, the committee organisers and, you know, everybody wandered through the door and then disappeared off into their various trials. Again, <laughs> <laughs> sitting at the various tables, you know, yeah. which I, I think is lovely. You know, there's there's a there's a sense that this, this was a community, and, and you go to what you know, don't you? Yes, I mean, you, yes. and, and the, the people that uh, relate you relate to. Entirely, yeah. entirely. So it's 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 a fascinating process, and and you know there's some stuff you hear and you're going, I just couldn't put that into the show because well, that's a little bit yeah. too much. And you don't want to be helping anyone grind axes. Either. <laughs> no, that's 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 another point. But it's it is a fascinating process, and when you sit with people who who have all had that experience, <clears throat> you're chatting away to them, and suddenly little memories come up that they've forgotten mm. and it starts uh, I was described it was described to me the whole process was described to me originally as like a packet of sausages you pull out one mm. and all the others come and when you're chatting to people you can see eyes light up and going oh god I'd forgotten completely about that yeah. and and do you remember that and then you can just sit back and listen and and the stories come um so it, it's 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 very rewarding that way uh, you mentioned already yourself that um you, you're not from here you, mm. you you moved to ireland um do you come at things then with a different perspective i'm sure you've been here for for, for donkey's years mm. but you know you you still have maybe you're not internalized in it if you know what i mean you're coming from that so you can maybe look at it with a fresh set of eyes do you think that helps it, it not just in unify but generally in your writing because you do seem to focus quite a lot on you know community stuff very local stuff yeah uh, i think it does i mean i've lived in ireland 26 years 27 nah, you're still years. a blowing <laughs> i'm still a blowing take another 30 uh, years yeah, minimum <laughs> exactly um i've been in i've been in letter kenny 16 years you know so um but i am a blowing yeah and i and maybe i'm not 
not so embedded in in mm. the community that I can take a step back and look at it and say, okay, well, that's that's really fascinating, but maybe there's a bigger picture here. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about, specifically Unify, is the nature of you know this globalization mm. where where you know companies come in take a veil of tax breaks you know and they're there for 20 years or whatever and then then disappear but then you also look at the legacy of unify and it uh, you know, if Unify hadn't been here, if Unify, that American money, well, Courtauld's originally, but Unify then hadn't mm. been here, almost certainly the likes of Primerica and Zeus and, uh, and other companies wouldn't have considered... It blazed a trail, really, didn't yes. it? And, yeah. and, and, and prove, uh, it proved that Letterkenny was a place that could sustain this type of thing and... and Exactly, exactly. And that's that's an interesting legacy. One of the comments, um, there's a Facebook page I set up, but one of the comments that I've had is, you know, at, at the time everybody thought, oh God, this is, the, this is the end of the world. But in actual fact, it's been quite a quite a remarkable turnaround mm -hmm. for a lot of people that, mm -hmm. that they came away going oh well, god what are we going to do now but then found different lives and moved on from 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 the unify sort of experience and when you're embedded in that sort of industrial culture for so long some people that were there from the beginning you know nearly 30 years you know, living in this town within the town again yes yeah, yeah so di di it's difficult <coughs> to 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 imagine a future after that but in actual fact there is mm. you know there is always a future after that as it relates to the, the music I I in this play is it a play with the music or a musical uh, i suppose it's somewhere in between it's somewhere depending in what, between. what where you wake up what how you feel each morning is it? yes yes <laughs> um, how do you choose the music for it though are you you're gonna sort of maybe go you know chronologically say a story was from a certain year or what we're trying to do is get some original music um for oh. a start uh, i think that would be um i think that's our our starting point and and there may be n references to the period in terms of the s of the style of music um but we're also looking to to um form a choir the what i'm terming the kings of kings and queens of kiltoy <laughs> um who will be hopefully you know singing singing harmonies and singing you know sort of like the backing to the to the songs but also i'm um, thinking about them being the sound effects effects as well for the show so that they're actually making the sounds of the factory and the the noises that you would have heard so it, it's again it's it's not really a musical mm. but it's not really a play with music it's it's more of an event that that even if you knew nothing about unify um, you'd be able to come up. Yeah, it has to have that broader appeal in, oh, in, in, in reality, yeah. and, that, and that's what people have uh, said to me about uh, the the Ritz. What's it called? called the again? Fiesta. The Fiesta, Fiesta. I beg your pardon. Yeah, the, the, you know, you didn't necessarily have to have a vested interest in that to yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. Um, y you're still gathering stories, and that's part of why we have you on because you're looking yeah. to speak to people. Yeah. Uh, but this is. Do you like working under pressure? Because, as I say, you're still working on it. I presume it's going to be later this year. That it's going to be. Um, they're expecting you. To <laughs> yes, it'll be. It'll be July. I think we're looking at opening on the July the twentieth. So, mm. so do you um, enjoy that pressure, or is it pressure? Maybe it's not. It's pressure, but it, it it's I, also. I don't want to. It's like February. You know that, don't you? Yes, I know. Uh, okay. It's it's, it's February, pressure, March, but April, May. Four, yeah, four I know, months. You I have. Know. Um, <laughs> It's pressure, but it's it, it, it's also a deadline that you can't miss. Yeah. So that you know, particularly that uh, at this point, uh, at eight o'clock on July the twentieth, this thing has to be ready. Yeah. Um, so you work backwards from that, effectively, and say, okay, I need to have the script or whatever ready by this date, and we need to start rehearsals by this date, and we need to make sure that this has happened by this date. So there's pressure there, but the, there's also, because it's always a very fluid process and a very creative process in terms of that, that end of mm. it, there's ways and means of doing it, you know. Excellent. Uh, and, you know, I have a feeling that those who contribute to these type of things end up having a sort of sense of ownership on it as well, and... and that really probably ties in very much with the community spirit that was in Unify. Yes. And probably still remains to some extent. F for me, the, I'm, I'm never, it's never my project. It's mm. the people who, who engage uh, with me and, and who share their memories and share their stories. It's their project. It's their play. I'm just a kind of a facilitator that kind of puts it all together as, a, as, mm. as you might a jigsaw. Probably more than that, but I know, I know where you're coming well, from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do people get in, in contact with you now? Um, well, the, we're, we're, we have a Facebook page, uh, which uh, I'll give details of, but it's Unified the Musical. Um, 
and if anybody uh, was part of the reunion, you can see a link to that on the Letterkenny Unify reunion page as well. Brilliant. Um, I'm running um, kind of open open sessions in Angrin Theatre um, Monday lunch times from twelve thirty till two thirty. If you want to wander down and ha have a coffee and have a chat, I'm there. Um, and also, we're doing Tuesday evenings from seven till nine. Um, not this Tuesday, but continuing after that. Um, so, if you're a former worker there, yeah. you can go down as you say, have a cup of coffee, and, yeah. and just have a chat and there. Just and just have a chat with me, or um, there's an email address which is unified twenty sixteen at g email.com um i'll give details of that as well mm. you can email me uh, if you wanted to have a chat you know one-to-one -one, or you can't make those times i'm quite happy to to, to chat to you um and uh, and the thing is that not necessarily all of these stories will ever make the the piece but they'll form part of it at the very least and so yes, they'll influence it if if, uh, if not directly in some form or other exactly because i mean f for the fiesta i could have written three plays mm. about the fiesta but I have to choose occasionally which particular story works within the narrative structure yeah. over, over a piece, and it has to be has to be fun, and, and you can't just do a, a, a do a history of the place. It has to be something that people want to come and see. Well, you'd also be doing it in a disservice. Yes. You, so really, yeah. wouldn't you? So, yeah. uh, Guy, that's uh, very interesting. It's been great talking to you. Um, really I think interesting. there's going to be. Well, I think that I don't think I know there's going to be a great deal of interest in that. We're going to link up, uh, link off uh, all your contact details on our social media. Um, but just to remind people, easiest way on Facebook search Unify the Musical. Yep. Unified. Um, unified the Musical. Yes. Thanks, Savannah, yes. again. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, the email address is unified2016 Steve at gmail.com. Gmail yeah. Okay, guys, it's been a pleasure having you on. Annabelle's story is uh, one of hope, love, light, and remembrance. And Helena Kyo joins me on the programme now to discuss this. Hi, Helena. Good morning, Greg. How are you? I I'm very well, thank you. And um, you lost Annabelle, Annabelle uh, Heather Kyo, uh, in 2014, didn't you? That's correct. That yeah. was your daughter, aged just two years and, and, and eight months. Um, yeah. What happened, um, Helena? Um, Annabelle was born in 2011, and she was diagnosed with a very rare syndrome. And I suppose um, her her prognosis wasn't great at the time. They didn't give us much hope for her life, and they more or less told us to take her home and enjoy her. And mm. um, and we did, and, and, and she was a great little girl. I mean, she had different um, ailments. She was fed with a gastric tube and she required 24-hour care and um, Jack and Jill were fantastic. Um, if people know the foundation, they came on board and um, helped provide care for Annabelle at home. A lot of people got to know Annabelle uh, during her short life, didn't they? They did, yeah. She seemed she seemed to attract a lot of the people. She she had um, a lot of hair and a lovely pink glasses, <laughs> and uh, everyone, even children, w were attracted over to her and t to talk to her and ask what was wrong with her with the tube. And and you explain so so gently to them; they understand so carefully as well. Where parents would be so embarrassed, but she attracted loads of people, and and we were known as Annabelle's parents. But everybody knew Annabelle. Yeah. You know, and and she was a special little girl, and and she, she she was just a little angel. I mean, she had so much love to give, and with all her ailments and everything, she just carried through life. And you know, she she kept defying the odds, and um, and that carried you through it too. I'm sure. Pardon. That carried you. Uh, that carried you and uh, your husband through it too. I'm sure. Her yeah. bravery to some extent. Exactly. I mean, um, they had said to us to take her home to care. Palliative care was. It was at the start of it, and, and really, after a year, her consultant in Waterford Hospital stopped mentioning palliative care to me. He said, she's defying the odds, leave her do her own thing. And uh, she was an inspiration to us and, and to everybody, you know, because I suppose at first there was a lot of fear in us, because it was the unknown, it was her first child. And um, we decided, no, we're not putting up obstacles to stop us from doing things with Annabelle and to give her a life that we had lots of memories and, you know, no regrets. It and, was a um, short two years and eight months, but uh, uh, full of memories. Fulfillment, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, she went to Lures on a, on a couple of occasions. We brought her to France and holidays and around Ireland. So it, it's lovely to look back and see all those memories of Annabelle and to have them memories with us, you know, because if, if I'd say anything to any parents out there that are only starting the journey like we have have had with Annabelle is, you know, take each day as it comes, but enjoy it and, and don't have obstacles. Mm. You know, you'll enjoy so much. And these children, like Annabelle, teach you so much. And 
it, it, they're so special and even today we're still learning and, she, and she's gone, you know, since 2014 but the memories will keep her alive. And um, it's interesting uh, that we're having this conversation today specifically because we learnt yesterday that, and it's a figure that surprised me greatly but it just goes to show how many people are affected and uh, your words there are, are great advice in that the 36 children uh, in this county alone, County Donegal alone currently receiving palliative care um, yeah. so... A lot of people will understand what you're going through. Yeah, it's it's not until you're in that situation that you realise that you're no, you're not the only one out mm. there. And Jack and Jill, we, we we didn't know Jack and Jill before Annabelle, Annabelle was born, and what they did to us. I mean, they instilled so much confidence and hope and faith in us and to care for Annabelle. And without them, that care and that outreach support of knowing to contact them whenever we needed to contact them, like any time of the night, the nurses that were involved in Annabelle's life gave so much care and, and they were tr throughout her life they were always there with her and giving us advice and they were our first port of call so I know what it's like to be in that situation and it's not hard it, it's tough going but the child is just it, it's you're just determined to give that care and you know Jack and Jill is all over Ireland including Donegal and we just wanted to give something back because we know the importance of having nursing in our cares in the family home. <laughs> And w what happened during Annabelle's life, uh, people came to light candles for her, didn't they? And, and that's the theme of how you're raising money for the foundation. Yes. Um, we created a video just to show the public um, Annabelle's life. And, and through their donations, that's how we received the help of Jack and Jill. And I think people sometimes donate and don't see the effect of their donation. So it was just to show people a short snippet of her life. And on the 13th of February, we were lighting a candle myself my husband Paddy in memory of Annabelle but we're asking all the public all around Ireland and, and the world anybody listening to light a candle of a child that's you know just gone before us or who's still present and needs a light in their life because you know you need you need hope and sometimes with hope comes light and, and if you just have some light you will get clarity and it's just it's to give hope and a light at a time when, when you need it. So And unity and show people they're not alone exactly. and, and, and We're not alone, no. Uh, we're all we're all together on this uh, and it's you know, the smallest of light will, will brighten any dark room and it's just parents are only starting the journey that we've been on and, and to let them know like you're not alone and it is it is tough going but they're worth it and yeah. See you nice and light. You can do it any time, but the focus is on February 13th, uh, specifically as a day, isn't it? Um, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's the 13th. But you can donate um, by texting um, AB Candle, all one word, to 50300. And if you watch the video, it's, it's at the end and you can see the video. And also uh, in Northern Ireland, you can go on to Just Giving as well and donate um, to Annabelle's Candle. How are you, Helena? Not, not too bad. Some days are hard, as, as you know, like, you know. Yeah, you just take every day as it comes, and and um, we had another little girl actually six months after Annabelle's passing, mm. and she keeps us going. Her name is Essie. Essie. And Essie. Yeah. How are you spelling and that? E S S I E. Oh, that's lovely. Where yeah, did you get the yeah. name from, uh, Helena? Um, it actually comes from the French word "estelle," which means a little star. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that she is. So yeah. So and the connection with Annabelle in heaven and everything. <laughs> I just thought, yeah, it, it sounded right, but um. Yeah, so she keeps us going, but of course you miss her every day and you miss caring for her, you know, but we were so lucky to have her for the length of time we did have her and, you know, she was so, so special. Yeah, it was a two-year, eight-month blessing. Um, exactly. Yeah. So people can text AB Candle to 5300 and um, they can contribute to that and the money goes to the Jack and Dill Foundation, doesn't yeah, it? And, and, it? And they're the people that got you through at times uh, what you went through and are going through of course um, yeah. and, and uh, let's uh, make sure that they're able to do it for others as well Exactly and you can you can go on to www.annabellescandle.ie and Facebook as well and you'll see all about Annabelle's life and our story and uh, and just to have a look and, and get an insight up to of Annabelle's life and you'll get to know her fairly quickly A very special goal and a, and a very special campaign and initiative from, from you and Paddy Thank you very much for chatting to me Helena Brilliant. Thank you very much for all your help, and if everyone could just share it and spread the word, it would be great. The Michaela Foundation camps, uh, girls camps indeed, are coming to uh, Donegal. Una Kelly's operation manager from the Michaela Foundation and joins us on the programme now. Hello, Una. Good morning, Greg. Oh, um, thanks for coming on the show. Give us the idea behind why uh, these uh, camps were established, targeting 11 to 13-year-old girls. Well, this is actually the, the fifth year of Michaela Foundation camps to, to be run throughout Ireland. 
We're delighted to, in 2016 to be able to offer 20 plus camps. So there's there's plenty of opportunities to volunteer, not just in Donegal, but but th- throughout Ireland. And whilst it might be snowing this morning, we're we're already thinking about s- summer um, at Michaela Foundation. Dreaming about summer, we are here as well. <laughs> um, the camp in Donegal runs from four to uh, from the fourth to the eighth of uh, July, which is the time of the year, of course, where people have uh, our younger people have a bit more time in their hands. Um, and it runs for one week. So describe what the camp uh, entails, Una. Well, the camps are they're, they're a really busy, busy haze of activity, Greg. Um, the girls can expect to be given the opportunity to rest and reflect, whilst also getting to take part in some really high energy activities and get exposure to some activities that they mightn't get to encounter or try in their in their everyday lives. Um, but we're, we very much rely on on the volunteers and the, the good people of Donegal to to inspire and to, to educate the girls aged eleven to thirteen that, that will attend the camp. A uh, specific age group, is there any particular reason why that that's the focus? Yeah, we've we've been very um, selective and, and aiming the, the camps for 11 to 13 year olds. We recognise it's it's a very difficult age for, for young girls and young boys. There's so much peer pressure from, from the media, from online sources and even just from friends at school. So we want to give the girls just a little bit of support and guidance about how they can remain true to themselves yeah. and um, in a world where there's so much pressure, and we also feel that at that age, it's, it's very difficult for for a lot of young girls transitioning from primary to post primary. Uh-huh. Um, so we find that with Loretto hosting hosting the camp in Donegal, it gives some girls the opportunity to get a flavour of of school life and to become somewhat familiar with the school building as well in advance of September. Where can people get more information on that? And there's lots of information on our website, Greg, at mm. michaelafoundation.com. We also have Facebook and Twitter pages, which we're, we're constantly active on. So certainly I'd love it if you could direct your listeners to, to our website and to our social media streams for further information and to sign up to volunteer. Okay, we certainly will indeed. So it's um, a the Michaela Foundation Girls Camp in Donegal in Letterkenny for 11 to 13 year olds for one week. Unforgettable, fun-filled activities from the 4th to the 8th of July. Thank you for telling us about it, Una. No problem. And volunteers should be age 17 and above at the time of Camp Greg. And mm-hmm. They must be willing to go through guard of Eddie as well. Exactly, which is standard. Uh, it's standard procedure. I think so, it does scare people a little bit from time to time. I think because uh, they're like, "Well, I'm a really good person," but it's just for, for to keep everyone. Um, it's for everyone's sake, isn't it? It's it, not. it is indeed, and we we will provide training not only on the delivery of activities, but first aid and child protection. So it's a wonderful opportunity for for volunteers to develop their own skill set and to Excellent. add to their own CV. Exactly, great thing for the CV. Una, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Thanking you, Greg. Bye. Take care. Take care. Uh, now, as Una mentioned there, um, th- we have, uh, rather than bombard you with uh, URLs and Facebook handles and this, that and the other, uh, we have all that information for you on our Facebook page. Uh, just search out uh, Weekend Edition on Highland Radio and uh, you'll get all that info there. A few weeks ago, we talked about the Park Run event, which was... Uh, due to take place in Falcar on Saturday the 9th. Park Run's a global event where you show up at your local park, beach or promenade every Saturday morning and run a 5K. Uh, now, Tom Feeney spoke to us about it and uh, joins us back on the show now. We wanted to see how it went. Hi, Tom. Good morning, Greg. Good to hear you again. It's four weeks, imagine, uh, already since we chatted the very first week. That was obviously before our first run in Falcar. So... We've had three or four now. We've just finished our morning run this morning. Uh, so it's going very well, Greg. You're sounding very fresh indeed. The cold weather didn't put you off. No. Now, listen, there were doubts this morning, and I did send an extra message. I had our, doubts our... about getting out of bed to come to work, Tom. <laughs> well, this is it. <laughs> this running. Is it. But isn't it true? Well, especially if you run, I mean, you're happy to get to work. But the funny thing about it is the more, the harder it is, the, the, the greater buzz you get That's afterwards. That's what people so, say, yep. Yeah, it's strange. There's no answer to it. But, uh, Greg, our figures were phenomenal. We were so delighted. We started off 156 the first week. 156 people? 156 right. people. And 197 the second week, 177 last week, and 93 this morning. Now, you know, we wouldn't have blamed anybody. Uh, we thought we'd get 20, 30. To or, almost so. get 100 in, in the cold weather. 
together because it in, would, you know. Yeah. Put, so it, it it is organically growing, and to get that, you know, a lot of running events have a spe- specific focus of they're for this or for that or to raise money for the other. This is and, and they're great. Don't get me wrong, but this is just people saying, right? Let's let's all go running together. It's simple as that. It's as simple as that, and you know, like all you know, simple things. Sometimes great success. I mean, you know, the start with at this stage, a fellow in London twelve years ago, he just wanted to get out, and and uh, he he had ten or twelve fellows with him for the first couple of months, and next thing they all just wanted, they liked it, they got a buzz from it. Uh, so it spread and spread and spread. Imagine that, Donald Donahue. I don't know if you saw the supplement in the in the uh, RT guide this week, and a very well written. Anyone that hasn't just know what Park Run is about. Get, if you if you see the the RT guide, there's a supplement there. I think it's Safe Food or it's Operation Transformation. But he gives a great overall picture. He explains everything. It's simple. Uh, Are you in that article, Tom? Uh, Falcara is mentioned, which is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, Falcara is mentioned, not not Tom or anything like that. <laughs> but it, it, what interested me when we were chatting first, Tom, though, is that it was. Uh, I'm not saying some things are exclusive or what have you, but it was open. It was like, you know, maybe you have this level of fitness, maybe you have that. It wasn't necessarily for all professional runners, uh, and it was a good time of the year, a good time yeah. to start it. And I think sure. maybe that's what resonated with people. Well, yes, it's it's hard to pinpoint it, but I suppose the time of year, it's good. I'm glad we got in. Uh, did Letter Kenny start today? I know they're in there, they're, they're soon coming up and on lows coming up, but uh, I was delighted we got in, in in the 9th of January there and, and got a good start because people do think about these things in January. But it's more than that now. People love the chat and the cup of tea afterwards. The volunteers, uh, Greg, have to get a special mention. We wouldn't be doing anything uh, unless we had... I have about 10 people now that are there before me in the morning. We make sure everything, the track is okay and the path is okay through Ballyconnell. And we put out a few cones. There's still a few potholes that we have to fix. You know, that type of thing. But the volunteers are just fantastic. So, you know, we have to mention them. And without them, of course, uh, it it wouldn't be as successful. So, again, a great ball this morning. Some heroes, indeed. Indeed, indeed. We've had visitors already, Greg, from Mayo, Belfast, Malahide, Armagh. People, once you join up, you see, and get your barcode, you're entitled or free to go to any park run. Uh, we had, I met a lovely lady last week. She was uh, staying in one of the hotels in Dunfanaghy, checked her Google, where's the nearest park run, and landed over to us in Falcara. So, I mean, that to me is fantastic. So, she did a good run and went back and enjoyed her breakfast. Simple as so there that. you go. And it's, Simple the, as that. it's the simplicity, I think, that's uh, uh, I think so, so attractive. Tom, it's been a pleasure, and it's always a pleasure to speak to you. Indeed. Thanks, Ray. God bless you. All right, you Tom Bye-bye. Feeney Bye-bye. there, the organiser of Parkrun in uh, Falcara. Now, can you cast your mind back to the lovely girl competition, uh, the annual event on Craggy Island in Father Ted? Well, a local shop in Kerry named Easter River has come up with something very similar, I'm told, a lovely legs competition. Patricia Murphy is a journalist with uh, Indo Life and Independent.ie, joins me on the show now, live from the shop. Hello, Patricia. Good morning, Greg. I'm not actually live from the shop, but I am live from Kerry. I'm down in the store. And are you going to the myself. shop? What is, what's going on there? Well, I guess it was an inventive marketing scheme um, started by Pat Lyons, who runs East River in the store on Church Street in the town. And I guess he just wanted to kind of get a bit of new business into his shop, so he launched this very tongue-in-cheek competition called the Lovely Legs Competition, which, as any Father Ted fans will know, is a play on the Lovely Girls Competition that features in the show, and he's had a remarkable response to it, which was unexpected completely. Give um, us an idea of what, what's going on then. I mean, is it is it only for women? Is the men turning up and whipping well, their legs out? Initially, initially, Pat did want it just to be for for women, so it, the prize is, Greg, to win 200 euro worth of tights, or <laughs> as Pat put it, a year's supply, but he, he unexpectedly has gotten loads of um, entries from Kerry men as well, so he's now informed me throughout, during the week that he's launching, he's going to be launching a male competition, but the details of that haven't exactly been um, confirmed or what the prize is yet, so... We'll wait with uh, we'll bated breath. Yeah, yeah, indeed. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of fun, isn't it? And as you say, it's a kind of a, a clever marketing ploy. Yeah, well, Pat. Some people said that the competition was a bit sexist, but um, Pat just told me that it was very tongue in cheek from the beginning. And I think these things, some people just take them a bit too too seriously, and it's all just a bit of fun in the end, really. Um, yeah, there is a, a there is a, a, a 
group of people of us who perhaps react before they f fully investigate what they're reacting to and maybe some people have been guilty of that on this one perhaps but uh, as anyone who's watched father's head and i'm sure you have as well greg the lovely girl competition is one of the highlights of the, that whole series and it's often referenced um in our in irish by irish people so i guess it was i think in my own personal opinion it was a very clever marketing um, moved by the owner of that shop in Lestol to um, to run a lovely leg competition with a play on that. Excellent. And okay. It have paid off for him. Are you going to be doing a feature on it, uh, Patricia? Well, we've done... I I did a story on Independent.e during the week and it did quite well. Good. But uh, maybe when maybe when the male legs start <laughs> pouring in, I'll do, I'll do a feature. Right? Well, people, people can check out that uh, article of yours then on, on the website, I'm sure, independent.ie, and as you say, it's a bit of fun. Uh, Patricia, it's been great fun talking to you. Thanks so much. Good morning, Greg. Bye. Patricia Murphy there, journalist with Indolife and Independent.ie. Joined in studio now by Patricia Swan, holistic health therapist. Thank you so much for uh, coming on to the programme again. You're welcome, Greg. And also thank you for telling me how to pronounce Buteco, <laughs> which is the breathing technique that you specialise in. Well, it's not so much that I specialise in it because I learnt it and I encourage people to learn it, but I don't actually teach it myself. Okay. So I'm just like the signpost for something that, that works very well. Last time, the, 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 a lot of the focus of our conversation was about the importance of, of feet and, and, and what have you. And I noticed, um, not I had this recurring problem with my ankles, you know, that really hurt me all the time. And I put it down to where I was lying or, or what have you. But I paid more attention to it after our conversation. And it turned out that it was actually just standing in one place. It gave me terrible pains in my ankles, up my legs and, and into my uh, thighs. If I stood, you know, if you were standing in a kitchen mm. chatting or something, what, mm. what would that be down to? Usually, we're doing something wrong. Mm. If, if, if our body's complaining, it's usually a sign that something that we're doing doesn't work for us. So that can be your posture, it can be your shoes, it can be uh, the fact that you do too much of the one thing. Mm. You might do too much sitting, so when you stand, your posture's actually a little bit out. So the first thing you do is listen to what your body's saying. The second thing is usually pain can be referred, so you could have pains in your hips, but mm. it might be coming from your feet. But when you look at somebody's feet, when they're lying down and you're looking at their feet and working with them, you can actually find where the problem is. You can't always find out what it is, but you can find where it is. So that would give you an indicator if it's to do with posture or if it's to do with lack of exercise or if it's to do with abuse which is um, often your abuse is that you do much too much driving or you sit too much yeah and further to that um because then what i realized is how important the feet are okay mm. because i was uh, traveling through an airport halfway through i got to the point where i barely could walk and i stopped at a chemist and got a pair of insoles and put them in and instantly I was able to walk again. Yes, it's daft. Uh, and I'm, I, this is something I'd endured for three or four days. And, you know, I, I was flying Ryanair, so I had to walk half the way to Portugal. Yes. <laughs> and uh, by the time I, I, I got somewhere over the sea opposite France and to the terminal, um, you know, I literally couldn't walk in these just insoles just with little bits of rubber under the heel. I, so it, it, I did think of you, and I thought, really, oh, it's astonishing how quickly something could be addressed. Yes, Yes, it, most things fix quite easily mm. and like your feet are usually trying to tell you what you're doing. You weren't born with shoes on, so you're actually born to use your feet as feet, not just little things that sat inside shoes and have the shoes do all the work. So often we don't stand properly, we don't walk properly because our feet are a bit domesticated, mm -hmm. they, they need to be a bit more free range. But when you have your feet worked on, usually you can see where the problem areas are. Mm. But right down the center where the insole usually protects you and gives you some support is the spinal reflex. So it's, it's like the little, um, it's like a map of your back. So you can actually see whereabouts in your back. And a lot of this would be probably because you sit a lot. Mm -hmm. So you can see where you need the support. Mm. So if there's, problems with your feet quite often there's problems f somewhere else in the body mm. me head <laughs> could be yes that's usually up around the toes yeah. and a lot of people have problems with toes yeah. and ingrown toenails and yeah. fungal toes and uh, and you get people in uh, that use your services you get them get the shoes and socks off you get down and you have a look at the feet and that's where you start the the 
the process. I don't, I don't get down, they get up. You know what I mean. <laughs> yes, they Stop lie. Stop taking me so literally, <laughs> will you? <laughs> they lie down on a table and with their head on I a pillow. Don't, I know you're not down on your hands and knees <laughs> at people's feet. It would be far more practical to bring them to your level. That's I understand it. that, yes. Patricia. So it's nice and comfortable. <laughs> um, but quite often they just fall asleep because yeah. they're there for about an hour. And they might be just thinking that they're having their feet done like a nice foot massage, but you're actually, at the end of it, you're much wiser because you can see, like, the feet are busy telling you that whole time what's going on. A caller says uh, they have, uh, their feet feel like they're burning at night. Yes. Quite often that's to do with diet. Mm -hmm. um, there are homeopathic remedies that can help with that. One thing I would try, it usually means your body's actually trying to detox um, one thing I would try is to give your feet a good scrub with a, like a nice sort of soft hairbrush and then run them under a cold tap before bed. Um, but this is a very common problem. But usually if somebody is in for a session and you're discussing that, you would look at their diet and there'd be some things that you would be able to remove from their diet that mm. should stop that. Um, a texter has an issue with RSL, uh, restless Leg yes. syndrome, RLS. Yes, that's awful. I had it when I was pregnant. Really? Um, you, you can't stop your feet from moving. Mm. Um, again, there's helpful things in your diet. Um, tonic water's very good, so not the gin, but the tonic is good. Um, and, yes, maybe some magnesium supplements. So it's, it's usually a dietary thing. Um, but y normally when you have something, you try and figure out why you have it. Mm. You don't try and fix it because mm. it's a problem. The you, cause yes. first and then yes. obviously yes. you go for the cure. Yes. Uh, yeah, I read up a bit, a bit about that myself and it seems to be, you know, you're just about to nod off and you have this sense that you have to move your yes. legs. Um, insomnia. Uh, a call has an issue with that. Uh, they can't get off to sleep at night. That's so many people mm. have this problem. Um, first of all, you'd remove all the obstacles to mm -hmm. the sleep, which would be um, sugar or a lot of protein in the evening or tea and coffee. So you'd be making sure that there's not something that's keeping your body stimulated in the evening. Then when your eyes are tired, usually it means you're tired. So if your eyes aren't tired, then maybe you don't need to sleep. You know, some people <laughs> don't there's no law saying you have to sleep eight hours a night you should sleep when you're tired and wake up when you're refreshed mm. so reading or something that tires your eyes is a very good way of getting off to sleep but quite often there there are homeopathic remedies and there's something called rescue sleep that you can buy in the health food shop which helps your mind just calm down but i would try reading i'd get to bed a bit earlier i would stop having sugar or sweet stuff in the evening no tea coffee after maybe four or five in the afternoon um if i had a cup of coffee at three in the afternoon i'd have trouble sleeping yeah and sweets or chocolate will keep you awake too They're stimulants aren't yeah, they? yeah absolutely as as and our body loves getting a little fix and I, I think that's probably good advice too for people with younger ones as well oh. you know um Tea or coffee, probably not as much an issue, but maybe that sweet snack yes, or whatever. Yes, or a have fizzy drink or, or eight yes, at night yeah, and yeah. you're wondering why they can't get off. And yes, absolutely. It. it should be sleepy food in the evening, which would mm. be your carbs and, um, yes, food that doesn't s get you up and going. You know how we sort of set up rooms for babies and there's some beautiful places and they're all soft lighting and warm and, and cosy and lovely blankets? We probably should do that for ourselves as adults too. Sometimes well, you know, make a nice yes. environment. Absolutely. And most of our bedrooms are f either filled with clothes or yes. filled with, um, there'll be a TV or there'll be your phone charges on or you've got an electronic clock or something. So if you, first of all, look at your bedroom and see, is this... Like, we're all mammals, and is we just it a want nice to curl up somewhere. Just yes. snuggle up and, and go to sleep. And is it peaceful? Yeah. Or is, are there too many memories? Is there too much going on? So, tell us about, we, we, as I say, we, 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 we spoke about this briefly the last time you were in, the Buteco breathing. Right. Um, now, it's, what, it's an exercise that you teach people. What are the benefits of it's, it? Buteco was a Russian um, medical scientist, and he discovered that the reason people tend to get ill is because their breathing is disturbed. Mm -hmm. So they're over breathing and this is just really common, especially in the West. And when we have too much going on, we tend to breathe incorrectly, which is too much and usually through our mouths as well. And we often breathe while we're talking or while we're eating. If we breathe through our noses and we breathe a little bit less, our whole system calms down a bit and it runs more efficiently. So then your body can repair the things that have gone wrong with it. So I just urge people to 
check it out. There's a website, um, learnbuteco.com, and it has little videos and it will talk about things like Parkinson's or MS or cancer or psoriasis, and you can look at how your breathing can be affecting the state you're in mm. because your body's designed to fix whatever goes wrong with it and if we just get out of the way of that and let it repair itself usually it will that's b-u-t-e-y-k-o in case <coughs> yes. excuse me in case you're searching it on the internet the caller says i've something called morton's new roma it started in my toe now has traveled to my ankle uh, are you familiar with that i don't know Re no um morton's new roma but in any case, there's something in the toe and it's spread to their ankles, so... I would just be really interested to see that toe and that ankle. Um, where something appears on your foot is quite often an indicator of something else that's going on in your body. Mm. So it would just be very... And if, if anybody's... I would love to... Um, S even to see somebody for five ten minutes and i wouldn't charge them for that just if they just want to um, i have to be careful what i, I say no, here I or there'll be a, listen, a I, crowd. you're fine it's, okay i know exactly what you're saying you, you you think if you had a look at it it'd be far easy rather than just what it's called and yes, uh, so it's good it's causation it's, if i if i like i wouldn't be able to fix everything mm. but quite often you can give somebody some suggestions that would lead them to something where they might think okay so that makes sense okay or i could change it through such and such a caller is a burning mouth and burning tongue. Right, well, that sounds like a chemistry issue, mm. body chemistry. So I'd be looking at... Um, There's celiac, the, I think that's... Okay, I'd be looking at diet. That's probably that their system's too acidic. Mm. There are all sorts of things that you can do, really basic things like... Um, some people don't do very well drinking tap water because of the, uh, the chlorine that's in it. Um, you can alkalinize your food quite easily it would be usually when there's something wrong with somebody i look at all the things they're doing which is what their lifestyle's like what their diet's like and then you start peeling back the things that are going to make a difference yeah. so we, we're really complicated you know we're so much going on with humans but if you just get somebody from the outside who can look at what you're doing and say well have you ever thought that this might be contributing to I such and so. such yeah uh, because i suppose when you think about it um we have to deal with so much now that even you go back 300 years ago didn't they if radio waves or anything or Absolutely. additives in food and as you mentioned additives in, in in water um now what about thought field therapies okay so this is something that came out of chiropractics and kinesiology and it's a you might have seen it on tv where they're tapping different mm -hmm. parts of the body um so it's a fairly simple routine that you can do that work on the meridians in the body the same places where an acupuncturist would use needles but you're just tapping those mm -hmm. points so you're stimulating certain parts of the body which work to unlock patterns in your body so it's like undoing a pattern so if you've got a pattern of being um claustrophobic or you are scared of driving or if you have um have been traumatized you can actually release the trauma around the memory so that you still have the memory but you don't anymore have the trauma that's affecting you mm. so it's a really it, interesting youtube videos on that as well where people that had quite lo long life long fears of or, or, yes, phobias or, and things or yes. memories you mm. know that were, were sort of controlling them from their childhood that really quite quickly using the tapping method they were relieved of them absolutely or, they or it became um very popular after 9 11 because they had so many people mm. traumatized at once and they had to find something that worked quickly because they couldn't put everybody through counseling who'd been traumatized mm. so and it's now taught in the red cross um internationally so it's a useful technique for someone who's maybe has to go into court and is really scared of um, having to make a court appearance or is public speaking scared, terrified of coming on the radio <laughs> were you tapping this morning <laughs> no but i have been tapping in the past yes <laughs> you shouldn't be you're very good in fact kathleen grant says you've got an excellent radio voice and wishes you all the well oh god bless her would you have any help for migraines uh, it's a granddaughter who's tortured with them yes I, uh, there again you you start unraveling what might be behind it mm. and it can be to do with posture it can be to do with diet it can be some trauma um so you don't anything to do with holistic you don't treat 
the symptom, you're treating the person mm -hmm. and you're trying to get the person so they don't have the symptoms anymore. So um, in migraines, there's, there are herbal remedies, there's tapping. You could, I don't really mind what works. And so sometimes I would use five or six different techniques with a person. And if something works, I don't know which to blame it on. Mm -hmm. But hallelujah. Yeah, um, well, as long but as children are much easier to fix than adults. Yeah, <laughs> yes. uh, cholera is bad. Pins and needles—they're waiting to see a specialist, which is which is very good. But they say that uh, they're so bad that even if you go to answer the phone, the phone could fall out of their hands. That's such a, the, the, the that's usually coming from the neck. Circulate or circulation? No. Uh, it could be. That's the specialist area as well, of yes. course. But for, from your what you've seen in the past, the neck can. Yes. If you've had a problem with your neck or whiplash or that sort of posture, if there's pressure on certain discs that run past your shoulders quite often, like I had it once with whiplash where I had amazing pins and needles for a few days afterwards, if it's in both hands then it's usually coming from the neck. Um, that's what I'd look at first. A caller has bad hot sweats day and night. Um, they're attributing it to the menopause. Mm, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing with sweats, that's your body doing the right thing and it's clearing you out right. and it's like having a big bonfire out the back and it's annoying. But And there are things you can do. You can get sage from um, the health food shop. But really, I would just be trying to manage them the best you can because you need to go through them because that's the healthy way to get through the other side of the menopause. But having a sauna maybe once a week yeah. is a way of you allowing your body to sweat and get rid of stuff without it mm. happening to you. So you can accelerate it maybe once a week Aye, or something. Just but help you, it along. It, it makes sense, actually, because mm. sometimes we do fight what the body is designed the body to do knows as well. what it's doing mm. we just don't like it sometimes so it's kind of a bit of an endurance yes it's a uh, god bless us all most people in indigenous cultures don't have menopause symptoms it's us in the west but i think it's because we're so overladen with toxins and additives and the things that we've dealt with because mm. because of our diets and what have you our body needs to clean out even more so it's sort of a good sign it's just really unpleasant to go through Patricia, tell us where you're based again in case, uh, and I'm sure there will be people looking to, to engage with you. I'm in Genesis Clinic in Gwador mm. on Tuesdays. I'm in Letterkenny Community Centre on Fridays. I have a clinic at the house in Chrysler. I work also cross-border. Um, so, and I do house calls. Mm. And it's uh, very good. One, a couple of more questions, actually, while we have you here. Would reflexology help an autoimmune disease? Reflexology gives you a good indicator of where the body's out of balance. Um, normally, the person would feel much better afterwards. When they're feeling better, they're more able to cope. And I would have to see. But the, the best thing there probably would be Buteco. And that's the breathing we yes, talked of. Yes. Um, a, a couple of questions, still talking about burning toes, strangely. Um, one's attributing it to um, arthritis, and they have arthritis in the toe. Other uh, suggesting it could be um, to do with rheumatoid arthritis and, and another diabetic. So it's, it's, it's a theme yes. of, of, of our calling so far today. Yes, but also, like, arthritis just means inflammation in mm. the joints. So a lot of people here think they've got arthritis and they might just have a system that's too acidic tea is a huge contributor to joint pain if you can look at what somebody's doing and what their lifestyle is and say okay so if you remove this out of your diet and just see if there's any improvement i would always be looking at what you can take away to make an improvement rather than what we can add in that goes you, it's part of what you have to do at managing expectations as well in that you know if you are talking about layers and we'll see if that works and that that it's not a quick fix and that sometimes it can take some time yeah, absolutely if somebody's spent 30 years getting arthritis you, you might not fix them in an hour mm. but if you point them in the right direction then they might you might see them five years later and they say you know that's got a lot better mm -hmm. but it's because they've been doing something themselves i'm all for getting people to fix themselves with a bit of guidance or insight mm -hmm. rather than keep coming back to me and me of keep course fixing and as, it. as you mentioned yeah. with the, the thought field therapies and the the take of breathing those are things that you can take home with you uh, and it's, um, it's about lifestyle and we all want to age well and not 
get more and more crocked as we get older <laughs> so if we can be doing something that makes us a little bit more well like just before christmas i gave up alcohol and coffee i love both of those things and i intend to go back on them at some stage <laughs> but i knew that my system needed a good clear out and since uh, well, when did you stop uh, those two products beginning of december and uh, did you notice a big change I just feel better. Yeah. I feel well. I socially it's not as great. Of course, yeah, but it's a pain it's in the it's neck it's <laughs> not drinking coffee and alcohol. But um yes, I've it saves you money and yes, aches and pains I was because I do an awful lot with my mm -hmm, arms mm -hmm. and um so I was getting sore elbows from the positions that I yes. work in. Um so that really eased off. Well, um and all the things that you love and you don't want to give up after a couple of days it wouldn't bother you mm. it's just those couple of days where you think oh god i'd love a glass of wine yes but when you're not having it it wouldn't bother me at all now if i never saw another bottle of wine or a cup of coffee but my friends all do that sort of thing of so course, you, you, yes you, you so it's, it's nice to you don't necessarily want take to shut, it or the leave door, it. Yeah. shut the door completely you have no. you have your choices uh, thanks so much for coming in again patricia you're very welcome it's been a pleasure uh, br is a musical event organized by transition throughout the county letter county schools involved are loretto secondary school and st unions and they're organizing concerts which will promote the irish language charlotte o'donnell a member of the uh, BR committee is in studio with me. Am I getting that correct? Am I? Yeah, that's it. Excellent. So, um, what are, what are these musical events then, other than what I've said? Um, the musical events are really just a social event for the transition year students to come together and experience different types of music. Uh, but it is in a, in a sort of uh, Irish music context, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, we try their best to promote Irish, the la Irish language, mm. but like, obviously not everyone is fluent and everyone has a different level of Irish, so we just use a couple of focal words and just different types of Irish words mm. to get it out there. Is this the first time you've been involved in, in, in one of these? Yeah, it's for transition years, so I'm in transition mm -hmm. year now and it runs every year. So every transitioner gets a chance, kind of. There seems to be more of an interest uh, in, in pop culture and a crossover with Irish music. There's a lot of recordings of uh, uh, songs being done off Gaelic and now yeah. even Ed Sheeran recorded yeah. uh, one of his songs uh, in Irish, which will, will do nothing but help. Um, is it just a little phenomenon we're going through, or do you think there is a, you know, younger people are, are, are more interested in the language? Yeah, definitely, I think they are. During the summer, uh, Aaron Moore runs a Gale Tucked, mm -hmm. so I attend that myself and some of my friends, and it really is a good way to learn Irish, to get to know people as well. So I definitely think that younger people are trying their best to learn Irish, because it it's lovely to know mm. the language. And um, do you come from an Irish-speaking family yourself? No, not at all. So this is an interest that you've... Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Sometimes we do what our mums and dads or guardians yeah, or granny and granddads want us. My friends, me, my sister, her friends. It's just Irish is lovely to know. Mm. And how good a speaker, Irish speaker are you now? Um, I wouldn't be fluent. I would have a few words, but, you know... Something. Yeah, yeah something. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, and you, you know, people learn the language, and then when they get older, get distracted and yeah. then forget it. So <laughs> you'll have to keep going with it. Um, now the event takes place. Um, it's coming up actually on Friday the fifth. So Friday, yeah. you, you, are, you are all well in place. So what, what's happening at the RCC in Letterkenny? Um, that night there is a gig at seven p.m. So everyone's welcome, and it's five euros. So you just pay that at the door, and we have a lineup of. Clans, their original group from Letterkenny, Indoor Wars, is also original group. It's two boys that are also on the Bioc committee, Kieran Dorian and Owen Rainey. So they'll be playing. And Rave Lodge is a girl band from Donegal Town. It's just four girls, and they they're very good, and they're really good at getting themselves out there as well. Mm. They they competed in the Junior Eurovision, so it'll be good to hear them. Uh, the Real Breed are from Derry, and DJ Mike Lachlan is also from Derry, so it's, it'll be a good night. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. And um, open to 
all. All open to everyone. Excellent. And and there's an Irish thing through all of it. I mean, not, are they all singing in Irish no, or is it Irish? No, not singing in Irish. Just the posters are in Irish. Maybe some uh, Irish words during the presentation. Yeah. Like that. I think that's a nice way to do it, to approach it softly, yeah, softly. Yeah, because, because you, some people might, and when they hear Irish, they think, oh God, mm. like they just lose interest. And I think that's what happens when, when, yeah. when, when people, particularly I think when you make that, uh, I, the the way Irish is taught in, in some schools, I'm not saying others, but I think particularly national schools, I'm not sure you're actually taught the language. I think you're taught the answer to questions. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you this question on Friday. Learn the answer. Now, I don't think that's really learning Irish as Even such. Even for the junior cert, like, you're told to learn a story mm. and just, you know, work. So, how word. is that going to help you? Yeah. You know, we need to get away from how you spell you know, if your grammar is not fantastic, mm -hmm. and just start speaking it, speaking it, definitely. and using it, and, yeah. and, and singing it, and I think that's what, uh, what what I like about the fact that you know a lot of um, younger people are re-recording big mm -hmm. songs in Irish because yeah. you know it might not impress the purists, but it's the language is being used, and that's what we need going forward. Yeah, isn't definitely it? speaking it mm. and knowing a bit of the conversation. Right, five euro doesn't sound like an awful lot to me for a full night's entertainment. It's at the RCC in Letter Kenny, and it's on Friday the fifth. That's this. Uh, that's next Friday. Mm -hmm. And run through the bands there again for us and the, the performers. Um, clans, Indoor Wars, Rave Lodge, The Real Breed, and DJ Mike Lachlan. And you don't need Irish to enjoy it. It's it's a general night yeah. out, but a, c a couple of fuck will be used, and there's uh -huh. posters and what have you. Did you need to mention anything else? Are you happy enough with that? Um, I think that's good. And the, how many of you are on the committee out of interest, by the way? There is myself, Grania Gilroy, Aggie Doherty, and oh. then we have Kieran Dorian, Owen Rainey, Sennon Cullen, and Colin McBurty. Have you enjoyed it, and would you do it again? Definitely. <laughs> a lot I of love times, organizing like, Do you? Yeah. You're control freak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Listen, um, it's been great speaking to you, Charlotte, and yeah. um, I'm sure it's going to be a great night. Hopefully, yeah. You'll I be nervous that. because, you know, you plan things and you don't know. Hopefully everything yeah. will run smoothly. Excellent. Well, we need a big crowd there. That's the RCC, which is a lovely venue uh, in Letterkenny, Friday the 5th, and a host of uh, exciting uh, young talent there from right across the region. Charlotte O'Donnell, thank you so much for coming in studio thank and uh, you. giving up your Saturday morning for yeah, us. Thank no you. Bother. Uh, Mick Taylor, hello. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing very well indeed. Now, uh, you're studying at uh, the Tourism College in Killy Bay. So you went back uh, recently for the next term, didn't you? Yeah, we, we started back Monday. Mm -hmm. And part of that, uh, uh, part of this term is that you have to work on an assignment. Well, one of the, one of the, one of the subjects, uh, you have to organise an event. Uh, um, and if you, you you could do a fictitious event, but you wouldn't be marked as well if you unless you'd done a real event. So my idea was uh, to do a real event, but something different. Instead of like a dinner dance or something, uh, I'm going to do a, a marathon uh, for suicide prevention. Uh, so you, this is to do with event management, and you can, as you said, you can you can do a mock up of, or you can actually do a, a, a real event. Yeah. And you're outside the box here a little bit because um, I'd, I would say not a lot of your peers would have decided to actually run a real event and for it to, to focus on suicide prevention. No one did. <laughs> uh. But the, 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 I just thought it was something different and uh, because in the last sort of two years I've known at least about seven people who have committed suicide uh, yeah. and it's becoming more and more sort of relevant and it touches everyone. Uh, when you start getting into it. Uh, so I came up with the idea of, uh, from absolutely scratch, uh, 10 people, uh, 10 weeks to run a marathon for 5,000. And uh, um, I have seven people signed up now uh, on my Facebook page to run the marathon. And I've got sponsorship cards uh, to give out because I'm doing it for uh, Peter House, who I haven't actually spoken to yet, uh, they will get half, and the other half is going to their Living Links, Donegal. Mm -hmm. And the reason I picked them is because uh, Peter House deal with uh, sort of the process running up to suicide, where Living Links deal with the process after the fact, with the families and people left behind, and the court, what what what, uh, what devastates a family. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to trying to. So to get both sides, um, 
and hopefully just make a little bit of difference. It's an ambitious um, challenge you've set yourself in terms of not just the marathon, which would be enough for uh, most people, but also obviously the fundraising aspect of it. Well, the, the, the concept idea is just the way I think of it, rather than what is probably the, the reality is that they, uh, when people are thinking about a uh, suicide, it's because they put up sort of hurdles or barriers, and they can't they can't get over it. Uh, so I'm sort of using the same concept, but in a different way. The fact that the marathon is sort of the ultimate sort of athletic thing you can do, but we're going to get over it together. Uh, rather than keeping everything bottled up, share it. Uh, um, and there's ten others. Uh, everyone's the same. I didn't want any athletes or anything like that because the aim is the ten people to start the event. It doesn't matter if we walk, we run, we crawl. But the ten people will finish together by helping each other. Now, if you, the, you, you've made a video, stuck it on your Facebook page, um, it, it's done really well, thousands of views, so there's uh, lots of interest, lots of feedback. Have uh, you got the ten people yet, or is, still, is there still spaces there, Mick? Well, I'm on, the, uh, I'm on seven people now. Uh, I have What I'm doing is whoever, whoever agrees to do it, then we introduce them on the page uh, with a photograph so you know who they are, name them, and uh, I have... Uh, four more people to go on, or three more people to go on on Monday and Tuesday, uh, whenever I get to meet them. So I have three more spaces, um, and once once them, once the ten are there, they will also put in updates of their training, their fundraising, uh, because five thousand is a big target. But the way I've done it, I've, bro I've, I've sort of broke it down uh, so it becomes easier for people. So the, every individual has to raise five hundred. Uh, and then I have printed cards up uh, and I've broken it down to each card only has 15 lines on it uh, because of the, the, the 10 theme I'm only looking for 10 euro donations uh, and they, if they have a friend they can give it out so you're breaking it down to 150 uh -huh. which is more manageable uh -huh. so the big, the big total might seem a, a, a hard target to hit but if we break it down, and again, using the theme, everyone works together mm -hmm. uh, instead of sort of being stuck as an individual. And that's generally the theme uh, the, and the whole concept, which goes down as far as uh, as the fundraising. Now, people uh, who aren't taking part can still follow the fortunes of uh, yourself and the others uh, via Facebook. So l tell us uh, what is the, the address people can search for there. Uh, if, to if keep they, if, they just, if they just put my name in, Mick Taylor, uh, mm -hmm. they'll get onto my page and whoever... Uh, it's a public page, so anyone can watch the videos I put up. Uh, and in the next, in the next sort of week, when the ten are finalised, uh, their updates will go onto the page. Uh, and the the ten, the ten, you can still get involved. You can take a sponsorship card. I've given out six sponsorship cards in the past two days, uh, and I have more to deliver to people today. Um, so it seems to be uh, a lot of people are the sort of affected by this, mm -hmm. uh, I want to do something for it because they know of people um, that have, like, sort okay. of taken their lives, as well as the, the not forgetting that the families left behind as well. Uh, and, and that ties in with your, your support of Pieter House and, and Living Links as well. Mick, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. We wish you the very best. Hopefully, uh, we might check in with you uh, a week out or something along those lines to see how uh, training yeah. is going for everyone and what have you. And we'll link your details via our Facebook page, and, uh, listen, thanks for telling us that. We hope it goes really well, uh, the fact that you're using this assignment rather than mocking up uh, organising a festival or something, that you're actually getting out there uh, and, and doing it for real and for a great cause. So thank you so much, and uh, uh, we fully support you in that, Mick. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Greg. Cheers. All right, take care. That's Mick Taylor there. OK, you're very welcome back uh, to the last segment of the programme. We're joined in studio by a Youth Council Chairperson. This is the Donegal Youth Council Chairperson of the Letterkenny Municipal District, Niall Hannigan. Also, hi, Niall. How are you? Not too bad, yeah. Right. Um, it's going to be called on Tuesday, whether voting is on the 25th or the 26th. Uh, we're, we're looking for a general election. And um, you want... To to ensure the youth council wants to ensure that anyone who has a vote, uh, particularly young people, obviously, because that's your mandate, that they register and use it. Oh, definitely. Like I, I see it as a as a waste if you don't really, you know, this is your opportunity to kind of affect your future and you know, kind of put your points out there that you want to do, and it's important that you use your your vote, your right to vote. 
I presume from a perspective, uh, a younger person's perspective, particularly those maybe travelling away for college, ideally you'd want the v uh, vote on a Friday where, where it's most likely people can get home to vote. Ah, oh, definitely. Like, just whatever's handier and, you know, that would, that would kind of increase the people that are want to vote and everything, so. Now, the numbers are huge. Over 2,300 people turned 18 uh, in the last 12 months. They may not be in the register and in a county of this size and even in a county of this size, that's a lot of votes. Oh no, it definitely is. Like, you know, it, it proves over other elections that, you know, the young people can kind of swing votes and everything and it's important that everyone that has the opportunity, you know, takes it, so. Check the register.ie because it doesn't matter what age you are, all of us can be guilty at times of moaning, complaining and, and, and criticising decisions and who's making these decisions. Uh, but I don't think really you have a right to do that unless you get involved in the process. No, exactly, yeah. Like, people, you know, looking for the TDs or whoever's in charge, you know, to kind of pick out, you know, people's um, interests, the young people's interests, and you can't really say that unless you, you have your say and, you know, you use your vote, like, so I don't see that as a valid point, like, so. Mm. Uh, historically, the Youth Council gets calls after an election or, or after the register is closed and, and there uh, people say, I didn't get my chance or I wanted, you know, so do it early, register early and then make sure that you can have your say. No, exactly, like, we're kind of, kind of promoting people to go out there and vote and you know it's very important for people to use their use their voice and use their right to vote do you look at what a party or what a candidate says or offers young people when when, when you'd be making a decision well i'm 17 at the moment hypothetically yeah no i'm um, uh i'd say you kind of you pick out you know the people that are talking about things that you're passionate about and if you're passionate about something you need to back that person and voting for them now, the Youth Council's organising a debate, a candidates' debate, uh, and inviting as many candidates that have declared so far to, to come along to it. That's going to be really interesting, and particularly to find out what the policies are, what their views are, on what they and what they can do for young people. Exactly. So on the 18th of uh, February, we're having a, a, a night in the LYAT, mm. and we've, be, we've invited um, some candidates forward, and most of them have accepted that they'd come. And uh, it's basically just to tackle, you know, youth issues and kind of get their point of view in it, and it'll give a great insight into, you know, what their what their thoughts are, and we'll probably give a bit of a youth swing to it, you know, mm. and then get into the serious stuff after. So it'll be interesting. And I think it'll be interesting too, because people like me, for instance, that have been doing this for quite some time, um, you know, you come maybe come back with the same stuff, you know, the same questions and uh, the same issues. But I think with the maybe the younger, fresher minds, that this will be an interesting debate in that, you know, new things will. Come up new ways of looking at it new ways of asking the questions exactly like there's been a lot of a lot of new stuff like the referendum with the marriages mm. coming in and you know uh, the young people probably would have had a, a big say in that oh yeah influence that and, hugely uh, you know that this is going to kind of give another give another angle to it and to hear the the candidates opinions will be very interesting so. mm, indeed look forward to that myself unfortunately i won't be able to make it but i'd love to uh but um who's to say what can happen closer to the time, <laughs> try, try and disappoint someone and get going there if I can. Um, that's coming up on the 18th of February in LYIT. I think there's going to be huge interest in that indeed. Yeah. A and, you know, we've seen the success of the Donegal Youth Council and its shadowing of the uh, the full council uh, and how it can influence things and influence policy and views are, are taken on and acted on, in fairness. The council gets a lot of criticism, but it has succeeded in that area. And I wonder why we don't have that nationally. Yeah, well, there is a court in Anog, um, and But you uh, don't get a sense that it's influencing anything. Do you know what I mean? No, like, that's true. You know, yeah. no. Like, there's a person that's elected from each county council, mm. our youth council around the country, and they're on a board, but they are having, you know, national initiatives, mm. like um, you can raising awareness for mental health and stuff like that. Last year was one of the main ones, and, you know, it would be great to see them have more of an influence, but they are they are going well at the moment. Mm, so. Definitely. So the structure's there, we just have to, to exactly. you know, make sure Watch that... It, yeah. Or even, if it's ha maybe it is happening, but let people know it's happening, so that there is a sense that... that exactly, that probably not um, not enough people that know about it and mm. um, you know so I think that would probably help. Right so if you've turned 18 and you want to vote in this election to have your say that's what democracy is all about check the register.ie. Do you have any views on whether people should be forced to vote um, no um, or penalised for not voting? Yeah, well, I think it's just, I, I think it's kind of idiotic. Like, you need to, you need to kind of use your, your, your power and your right to vote. Like, people have worked hard over the years, to, you know, to, to gain that right to vote. And in many countries, it's still not there. But, mm. you know, in Ireland, it's, it's there. And not that they should be punished, but I just think they should be, you know, kind of, 
um, helped, you know, to vote yep. or given advice on what to look out for and stuff like that, but I think it's very important. Okay. Uh, and how's things going on the Youth Council generally? Oh, it's great, yeah. We've just kind of, um, into our second term as Youth Councillors and we've got a few initiatives coming up and everything, so it's very exciting. Has your interest in politics grown or has it been destroyed <laughs> by <laughs> seeing perhaps more firsthand what's going on? Yeah, well, um, in the Youth Council we try not to pick any sides, you know, keep it nice <laughs> and open, but, um, no, it's, it's great. I, I always had an interest in it, so just, um, no, it's great. I really enjoy it. Always a pleasure to speak to you. Check the register.ie. Uh, there's 2,300 people that potentially could be on it and may not be on it, so get on it if you are. That debate, LYAT, the 18th of February. Uh, Niall uh, Hannigan, who is the chairperson of the Letterkenny Municipal District Donegal Youth Council, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks very much.